Hi, hello, welcome to the Physionic Podcast, or welcome back to the Physionic Podcast, if you're unfamiliar with who I am. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine and uh, have a bit of background in nutrition science. And, uh, well, obviously this podcast is going to be centered around uh, women, and I am not a woman, admittedly, but uh, still I think that I can offer some insight if you'll take it or not, uh, related to women's health as it relates to the ketogenic diet, uh, because I'm going to be covering two studies in my quest to try to understand the effects that the ketogenic diet has on various health markers, cholesterol, insulin, blood sugar, uh, triglycerides, blood fats, uh, and things of that nature. And I think at this point I've read about 12 studies on the topic as well as a few meta-analyses and uh, I'm, I'm starting to get to this point where I'm starting to see these trends that, uh, that then I can report on. But for this podcast specifically, I'm going to be covering two studies. I, I've been going through studies so fast that uh, I can't just cover, uh, which I suppose is a positive. I can't just cover one study in one podcast anymore. Uh, sometimes I'll still do that, but uh, you know, on this particular topic, otherwise uh, I, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to have so much content with every single study with every single podcast that it's going to end up dragging on for like four months at this rate. So uh, I will be covering two studies today, uh, covering the ketogenic diet for specifically women. And if you're watching the podcast, uh, I'm doing a little bit, a slight difference in how I'm presenting uh, the information. Uh, maybe you might be able to tell some of that, that, that difference once I cut through uh, to, to the uh, actual visuals and whatnot. But the reason why I'm doing slightly different is because it always bothered me that I didn't have a mouse to actually be able to show the trends in, in the data and actually be able to point out some, some anomalies in the data. So anyway, I, hopefully this will work out, but if it doesn't, uh, please excuse any bugs that there might be. Uh, however, if you're listening to the podcast, nothing is going to change for you as always. That said, what are the two studies that we're going to be covering? Uh, we're going to be covering study A and study B. So I've, I've, used uh, two letters for them. So study A is a ketogenic, low carbohydrate, high fat diet increases LDL cholesterol in healthy, young, normal weight women, a randomized control feeding trial. And study B is an isoenergetic, very low carbohydrate diet improves serum, HDL cholesterol and triacylglycerol concentrations, the total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol ratio and postprandial lipemic lipomic responses compared with a low fat diet in normal weight, normolipidemic women. That is a mouthful. Uh, I totally get that. But uh, I will have both studies linked for you so you can uh, you can look at them for yourself. Of course, I'm kind of picking out certain data points that I find are the most telling, most interesting. But uh, I certainly encourage that you look into the other data as well. And of course, as uh, later on, I'll have the more condensed version with the graphics and all that, that'll come out and then I'll, I'll have uh, my notes so you can actually pour over those as well uh, once that releases. Okay, but without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into these studies. Uh, let me refer to my notes a little bit here. Uh, study A and study B. So they have, uh, they're obviously slightly different, but uh, they do both cover the ketogenic diet and they both cover uh, women specifically, and they don't just look at cholesterol, even though that's their, their main measure that they end up looking at. So study A, they recruited, uh, they actually recruited, I think, 24 women, but they had a few women that ended up dropping out. So they ended up with 17 participants in this study. And the study or the, the, the participants were put on a ketogenic diet for four weeks and then they had a washout period, meaning that they just returned back to their normal lifestyle, you know, no intervention of any sort for 15 weeks. And then they came back to the lab and were instructed on uh, consuming a control diet. So that control diet was uh, something that's placed, set in place by the, the researchers. So it is different from the uh, just regular day-to-day -day diet, but it includes carbohydrates. So the main intervention diet was the ketogenic diet, and the other kind of comparison diet was the control diet, which included carbohydrates and therefore was not ketogenic. Uh, 
Now, the other study, I'll discuss that real quick, and then I'll come back to how they ended up doing these ketogenic diets uh, for each study. So the other study, study B, uh, was done in 10 women. And in both of these studies, there's similarity here that both studies looked at healthy, normal weight, normal characterized by BMI standards, which of course has, has its issues, but for general population, it works really well. Um, and normal weight, healthy, and young. So all these individuals were, I think, in their 20s. So this is going to, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll put it here. The this will be highly applicable to, you can actually get the takeaways, the conclusions that we'll get from these two studies will be highly applicable to young, healthy, so normo, normolipidemic, meaning that uh, there's no elevated cholesterol or elevated uh, triglycerides, and uh, normal weight individuals, So, and specifically women. So if we can actually kind of extrapolate further into, you know, for men or for older women or for uh, overweight women or, you know, we, we can't. Uh, however, what I can say based off of my other reading, which has covered all those different populations, uh, there is a lot of similarity. So there isn't going to be too much divergence. And I'll actually mention one difference between men and women uh, as it relates to the ketogenic diet, which I found uh, rather interesting. So I'll, I'll throw that out there as kind of a teaser. Okay, so th so the second study looked at 10 uh, women, and they also did four weeks on the ketogenic diet, and then they had uh, four weeks on a control diet, if I remember correctly. Right, so on that control diet, of course, had uh, carbohydrates included. And they had a four-week washout period between the two diets. So instead of 15 weeks, they had four weeks. So quite a bit shorter. Do I think it makes a difference? Probably not. But still, it's something to, to keep in mind. Now, the ketogenic diet, as designed by these two studies, going back to study A, uh, was ketogenic diet was pretty strict. It was 25 grams of carbohydrates. So that's definitely ketogenic. Uh, and majority fat. And unfortunately, it was... Um, I believe it was 70% or something like that of uh, fat, dietary fat intake, so with the rest, of course, being uh, protein then. Now, if I remember correctly, it was 33% saturated fat, and that's actually going to be important later on. So uh, the majority of it was unsaturated fats, but it's still a pretty high amount of saturated fat included. And the uh, control diet, as I mentioned, was just... A standard diet, I think they based it off of a, a, previous, a series of previous other studies that had used this control diet. You know, it's just got a, a decent balance of, uh, of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, something that you'd kind of just typically see. And both diets were designed to be weight stable, meaning that they figured out these people's uh, caloric intake and then uh, instructed them to, to eat enough so that they wouldn't uh, lose weight. Unfortunately, however, uh, that's tough to do. It's at least more difficult to do uh, with a ketogenic diet. So they actually ultimately ended up losing a little bit of weight, just a very small amount, like one kilogram which is like about 2.2 2 pounds. So not, not a whole lot of weight, but they did lose a little bit. And then they took blood markers or blood measurements uh, to measure cholesterol, triglycerides, blood, uh, insulin levels, blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they did that for the, at baseline, so before they were put on the ketogenic diet, and then four weeks later, and then when they switched, and, the, and then they w went on to their control diet, they also had measurements done there as well. And then we can compare the two diets against one another, but we can also compare uh, a, the pre versus post, so pre-ketogenic diet, and then four weeks afterwards, were there any changes between those two time points? So uh, it's gonna be kind of interesting because uh, some of that is actually gonna be more telling than, than comparing between the two diets. Now, study B uh, used not, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily consider, I think the layman would probably not consider this uh, a 
ketogenic diet. They would probably consider this a very low carbohydrate diet, although I believe that they did have elevated ketones in study B. So study B showed that they had less than 10% carbohydrates. Typically, you want to be under 5% carbohydrates for, for most people to consider it ketogenic. But Still, regardless, is very low carbohydrate diet. So less than 10% and then 60% fat with no restriction on the type of fat. Uh, however, uh, again, here they did end up consuming, I think, uh, slightly over 30% saturated fat as well. And the other diet is considered a low fat diet, according to the researchers. Uh, the comparison diet, so the control diet, was, uh, I believe, 25% fat, so much lower and, of course, much higher in, in uh, carbohydrates. Okay, and then they took, uh, obviously, again, same thing. They took measures before the diet started, so for the, the low fat versus low carb. And then they did uh, again at the end of the four weeks for each uh, so they can compare between the diets, but also at the various time points, baseline versus four weeks later. And again, for some reason, well, maybe that's not too surprising. Both diets ended up leading to a bit of weight loss, but no differences between the two. And I think it was only like, I don't know, a few pounds. It wasn't anything extreme or anything like that after four weeks. Okay, so now... Let's, uh, now that we have the study design kind of out of the way, so we understand how these studies were run, they're pretty similar, four weeks long, right, with a different washout period, but different, you know, similar measurements, similar statistics, similar things like that. Um, still, it's, it's going to give us some, some added information. There's one point where they very much differ, which is really interesting and kind of puzzling, but uh, we'll, we'll address that in just a little bit. Okay, so if you're watching, I'm going to throw out my, my presentation as I have it, and we're going to be going through the data first, and then I'm going to go through a bit of a discussion on uh, how we can interpret some of the things. I've got a graphics and stuff like that, so you can actually see what some of this stuff looks like as well. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully it's helpful. Okay, so the first thing, let's discuss cholesterol, which is the biggest thing that both of these studies wanted to look at. So the first bit of information that I'll be presenting to you is uh, from study A, so the very first study. And study A, they looked at LDL cholesterol, and they looked at total cholesterol, and they looked at HDL cholesterol. And they also, I, th I believe they also looked at non-HDL cholesterol, but that followed a similar trend as what I'm about to present. But something else that they did, which was uh, unique and, and really cool, is that they ended up looking at the size of the cholesterol particles. And I'll, I'll explain to you why that matters. It's greater depth and it's more information on the health that can be kind of taken up based off of off of that information. So they actually started looking at the size of the, the cholesterol particles. Again, I'll explain that in more depth uh, a little bit later on. But so again, mainly looking at cholesterol here. And what we find is that after four weeks, this is specifically four weeks after the ketogenic diet, that there was an increase in total cholesterol, an increase in LDL cholesterol, an increase in HDL cholesterol, and they, 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 they separate the size of the LDL cholesterol particles. So just to explain that, you have your total cholesterol, which is made up of a series of different types of, different types of cholesterol. Uh, and there, people sometimes get kind of jumpy because you say, oh, well, it's cholesterol. But really, they're, they're like these protein packets that hold a bunch of protein and fat packets that are in a globular uh, shape. And I'll, I'll show you some images in, in just a little bit, but um, they're just a glob of protein and fat. And inside of that, there's cholesterol that's being transported. So it's not like the actual cholesterol is free, freely just moving around uh, the bloodstream in this uh, situation. So, and those packages can be either much larger or they can be much smaller. And if they're larger, they can also be less dense. So, and that's how they're separating them out. So with total cholesterol, you have uh, low density lipoprotein. 
that's so it's low density so there's not much inside of it uh hdl is high density so that's where you get the lipoprotein that's high density and then you have very low density and then you have uh intermediate or inter intermediary density lipoprotein those all make up uh, the total cholesterol, but the main ones that people focus on is LDL and HDL. So what the researchers did here is that they focused in on LDL and they separated it out based off of the different subclasses based on size and density. So the large ones are classes one and two and the small ones, which are more dense, are three through seven. And after separating those two out, they found that there was with the ketogenic diet, there was an increase in both of them with a, a pretty substantial increase in uh, the, the large uh, LDL particles. And I don't actually show the data here, but there's, there's another measure that they did where they actually looked at the size, like the actual diameter of the LDL particles. And they found, I don't think it was statistically significant, but they started to show that maybe there is an, a, a, a decrease in the size of the LDL particles, which is going to be actually really important uh, as, as we get further into the, the podcast. Okay, so, so overall study A, com just cholesterol increases across the board. Okay, so just know that. Now study B, does study B confirm that? Does study B show anything different? And study B looked at total cholesterol, LDL and HDL, so did not look at non-HDL cholesterol and didn't look at the particle size. Um, actually, I th maybe they did, but it was, I think, in, in a different piece of data. They ended up finding uh, no, no differences from what I remember or no uh, significant differences. So here, we're not just getting information because, again, they're really comparing against a low-fat diet as well as the quote unquote ketogenic or very low carbohydrate diet. So we can not only look at this comparison between the low fat versus the very low carbohydrate. And if you're watching the podcast, you can see that I've, I've marked that on the very end there. So uh, that it's versus low fat. So that's a comparison between the two diets. Actually, <laughs> might as well use this. I'm sitting here like using my hands, trying to like, <laughs> try, trying to explain this and I can actually show you now. So right here, I've, I've marked this off as versus low fat. So this is a comparison of low fat versus very low carbohydrate. So at uh, week zero against week zero, week two against week two, and then week four against week four. And that's certainly telling, and that's important to, to actually be able to establish differences between the two diets. But actually also, uh, they run statistics on the pre versus post. So this means that week four is compared against week zero of the very low carbohydrate diet. So taking out taking the low fat diet completely out of the equation. And then they also have statistics for the low fat diet, but we're more interested in the very low carbohydrate diet, but I'll still tell you about the low fat as well, because you know, why not? Okay, so here looking at cholesterol, they show that there is a statistical difference between the very low carbohydrate versus the low fat at, and we're going to be focused more so on the, the week four uh, situation. So week four versus week four, you see that there's an increase in cholesterol. So very low carbohydrate diet, again, showed an increase in cholesterol versus the uh, low fat diet. Was that true for the LDL? So what I just reported was total. LDL also showed an increase in uh, the, the cholesterol with the uh, very low carbohydrate diet. And HDL also increased, which did not increase in the uh, low fat diet. So that's a comparison between those two diets. But then if you look at the actual comparison between let's say week four and week zero, you see that week four actually has elevated levels by comparison to before these women were on a ketogenic diet. So they weren't on a ketogenic diet at week zero. And then four weeks later, they measured their cholesterol again in the exact same uh, way, same manner. Everything else is as similar as they possibly can make it. And they find that uh, with week four, you have an increase in blood cholesterol. So according to two statistical measures, or stu two statistical analyses, I guess I should say, uh, you have increases in cholesterol. And that was also true for uh, LDL and HDL.
Okay, so there we have it from two different studies. Uh, and I'll, I'll go over this again at the end, but from two different studies and some explanations at the end as well. But uh, the ketogenic diet or even a very low carbohydrate diet seems to increase cholesterol. Now, let's move on to <clears throat> blood fats and sh blood sugars, which is uh, something a lot of people are interested in. Uh, can we necessarily say that this is going to apply to people that are diabetics? No, but honestly, again, from my previous uh, reading and whatnot, the other studies that I've looked at, uh, there, there definitely are actual benefits of the ketogenic diet uh, for people who are diabetic. So here we're looking at study A, and study A is the only one that looked at uh, blood sugar levels and insulin levels, but study B did look at triglycerides or blood fats. That's how I kind of, uh, uh, in layman's terms, like to explain it. So triglycerides are blood fats. So with blood sugar here, I find that uh, there's they have 4.9 millimolar levels. And then after uh, the four weeks of being on the ketogenic diet, the treatment effect here shows that there's a reduction in blood sugar, blood glucose levels. That's why I've got um, this, this set up as green. There is a difference, but it goes down. So there's a decrease. And insulin also has a similar effect. So it's uh, it's at one point and then it ends up decreasing across the board. And here we see, if uh, you're familiar with statistics by any chance, uh, you might recognize that this is the, the overall variance, the, the variability um, in terms of all the, the individuals put together. So for each individual, they get a particular number and then they average that and then that's what they get here. Uh, that's what the, that's what usually statistics are based on. But uh, you might also be interested in knowing if one person actually has an increase in blood sugar, for example. But since both of these numbers are negative, so on either side of that average, that means that you can be quite certain that there, it will always lead to a reduction in blood sugar. And the same exact was true for insulin. So, and although they don't actually measure uh, insulin sensitivity, I would imagine that insulin sensitivity probably improved for these individuals, but that's, that's purely speculative based off of the, the information that we have. Now, looking at triglycerides or blood fats, uh, they do show that there is a slight increase in these blood fats as well. So that's really the only one that ends up uh, being shown or ends up being tested in study B. And this is where things actually get really divergent because here, according to both measures, you get a difference in blood fats compared to study A. So study A showed an increase in blood fats, triglycerides, but study B shows a dram pretty dramatic decrease in blood fats. So Again, if we compare our uh, very low carbohydrate diet to our low fat diet, and we compare week four to week four, uh, we see that the week four for the very low carbohydrate diet is considerably lower than it is for uh, the low fat diet. And even the low fat at the week two mark sees a pretty dramatic increase and then it normalizes again. So that's something to keep in mind, kind of an interesting uh, event. Now, and then if we compare the week zero of the low carb versus week four of the low carb, so week zero being no low carb, they, you know, they were just eating their traditional diet, their diet that they eat at home, and then they switch to ketogenic or low carb in this situation. And after four weeks, they sh showed they had a decrease in, uh, in blood fats. So that is two divergent results. Uh, really interesting here. So that's going to be something that needs to be investigated further as well. Okay, so now let me kind of go into a bit more explanation on uh, all this. And I'll also be going into particle size or, or cholesterol particle size and why that matters. Okay, so according to both of these studies, cholesterol increased. Uh, why might that be? Now, I'm sure there are probably multiple reasons for this, but to explain the physiology a little bit, um, essentially in people that aren't hyperlipidemic, meaning people that, are, or that don't have uh, increased or uh, have a, a genetic background that predisposes them to have a 
different way that their liver deals with cholesterol. Uh, that's very general, but I, you know, I, I don't want to bog this down too much. Ultimately, you have, you have the general population, and then you have some people that kind of fit a similar background. And then you have your hyperlipidemic or hypercholesteremia uh, individuals that have uh, high levels that tend to have elevated levels of cholesterol because of their genetics. And that typically happens because their, their liver is functioning differently than how a general population person might be. So, but in general, assuming that's not the case, people that have cholesterol in their bloodstream, that cholesterol will bind to particular receptors on the liver and that will get internalized. So those receptors with the, the, the cholesterol particle attached will enter the liver cell. The liver cell will then have a lot of chemical changes within it and it will actually reduce the production of cholesterol, thereby reducing the blood cholesterol levels. That's how it modulates. So your liver is constantly reading, quote unquote, reading your cholesterol levels and then adapting to that. And your intestines do something similar by, by changing the absorption of cholesterol as well. So those are two different mechanisms. Your liver can also dump cholesterol. So it can take up cholesterol and then dump it uh, through bile. Now, so that's kind of a traditional system. And the researchers of this study, along with other studies that I've covered, have mentioned that saturated fat actually reduces the number of these cholesterol receptors on hepatocytes. Hepatocytes are liver cells. So making them less sensitive, so making the liver or making these hepatocytes less sensitive to the blood levels of cholesterol. So you may have elevated blood cholesterol levels and saturated fat would somehow impede these, these receptors from uh, being produced and being put onto the cell membrane to then accept uh, blood cholesterol levels. So that would, that could be one of the mechanisms for why this is happening, why you see this elevation in uh, blood cholesterol. Now, this has actually been postulated by several different studies and, uh, you know, in my cleaner content, in my, uh, you know, more well-edited content and whatnot, shorter content, I'll, I'll be explaining a little bit more of how that functions and whatnot uh, because of the information that I've gleaned from a lot of the other studies. So that could be an explanation for the cholesterol. So... And saturated fat, the reason why I mentioned saturated fat is because both of these studies, they, the individuals in the studies ended up consuming for their ketogenic diet or for their very low carbohydrate diet. Remember, it was like 60 to 70% fat, dietary fat. Well, about 30% of that was saturated fat. That's, that's a good amount of saturated fat. Okay, so now I, I, I do also want to mention something about particle size. I did promise that I would discuss that because I, I was pretty vague before. Well, okay, so you have these particles there, these gl globules of proteins and fats, and within them there's also this cholesterol. So the particles themselves are made up of proteins and fats and cholesterol. And that's that gets transported throughout the, the bloodstream, and as your cells take up different things uh, and spit stuff back out, then the, the structure of the cholesterol particle changes. Okay. So, and there, we characterize them as like different uh, sizes and different uh, densities of these cholesterol particles. Now the study, I believe is study A that, and actually I think both studies looked at it, but study A was, was more rigorous about it. So study A, uh, mentioned that they had split it into two different categories. So these large cholesterol particles, which, you know, I've, I creatively just made it a little bit larger. <laughs> um, so these, these large cholesterol particles and smaller cholesterol particles. Now, women have ten, seem to have an advantage in that they tend to produce larger cholesterol particles. Now, why is that an advantage? Because smaller cholesterol particles are more prone or thought to be more prone to oxidative damage, meaning oxidative stress, meaning that they can get damaged. So the structure of the actual cholesterol molecule can get damaged. 
And why that's a problem is because if you have greater levels of oxidized LDL particles or oxidized uh, cholesterol particles running through your bloodstream, they can catch at particular what are called bifurcation points in your vessels. So your vessels aren't just one line, right? And you've seen graphs of you know your blood system. And if you haven't, look it up. I mean, right, just type in circulatory system uh, and you'll, you'll find it. Um, and it branches in all these different points. And those branch points are, are points that uh, you can get cholesterol particles that get stuck. And if they get stuck there, what happens is immune cells have to go in there and start cleaning up that, that area. And sometimes that can lead to all kinds of uh, other issues. I'm not going to go into too much detail with that, but ultimately those oxidized particles have a greater propensity to recruit more immune cells. And you may think, oh, my immune system's coming to help. But in all reality, your immune system can be detrimental uh, in that, you know, inflammation and whatnot. But in that, uh, they start to create blockages. So kind of like think of like a traffic jam uh, at this, this bifurcation point. So the splitting of one vessel into two vessels. And these smaller particles are more prone to this oxidative damage. Therefore, uh, those people that have higher levels, they may have, let's say, let's say you have the exact same amount of the actual amount of the particles is the exact same between one group and another group. But one group has smaller LDL particles and another group has larger LDL particles. The group with the larger LDL particles will most likely experience less heart attacks and less cardiovascular disease simply by the nature of the fact that those particles are larger. Okay. We don't, I don't think we fully understand why uh, beyond what I just explained, but women have an advantage in that regard, in that they tend to have more of those larger particles and men tend to have more of the smaller particles. Now, allow me to break that down a little bit further, if you'll allow me. Uh, it also seems that people, just like I talked about a genetic background for uh, hypercholesteremia, where you have the liver functioning differently because of the genetic background uh, in that it keeps elevated cholesterol. It can't sense cholesterol quite as well, and that's independent of saturated fat. Well, it's also possible that there's a population, and they've looked into this, that uh, especially with men, but um, it, I believe it can happen with women. I imagine it can happen, but don't quote me on that. Um, where you have pattern A and pa pattern B. And what that means is that pattern A individuals, men and women, let's say, uh, but definitely men, have g larger cholesterol particles. So they tend to be less, uh, less in danger of cardiovascular disease. However, pa pattern B with that genetic background, they tend to have three times higher cardiovascular uh, danger. And so I, I'm wondering if potentially the difference between these two studies, I think uh, one study, I didn't actually show the data for study B, but study B did look at the cholesterol size and they didn't find any real like dramatic differences. And they mentioned, they mentioned two things, but one of them was this point right here that it's possible that these women may be more of this, uh, pattern A, and therefore may be more protected against these changes in cholesterol uh, in terms of the actual size of the, the, the particle, because obviously they still saw increases in overall uh, cholesterol size. And there's some debate because some researchers say, well, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, maybe it matters, but really we should also be looking at overall amount of cholesterol. Now, the other argument is that there may be some differences between uh, men and women in that regard as well. And I, that, uh, that may actually also carry over to uh, triglycerides, which I'll, I'll get to in, in just a second. But so the point is that uh, you can have these two genetic backgrounds and one of them is kind of unfavorable and the other one is more favorable. And also sex differences that women tend to have more favorable cholesterol uh, particles. So... There you go. There's a, there's a roundabout explanation without even going into extreme depth on, on why that's, that's an issue. Okay, so now let me, uh, let me address just one last thing.
which is, and then I'll go into the conclusions and, and, and whatnot. Let's discuss a little bit on the triglycerides and let's discuss a little bit on the HDL uh, particles. So I don't actually have graphics for this, um, but I wanted to describe it a little bit. What can happen here as well is that with triglycerides, with these blood fats, and we saw two divergent results and really I can't give you, I can't say, oh, well, one study's correct and the other study's incorrect uh, because I don't know. Uh, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to continue, of course, to, to look at more studies and then try to find that trend, uh, just like I've promised with, with cholesterol. But for the time being, just know that the researchers here postulate that it's, there may also be sex specific differences in, in triglycerides, that for uh, women, there may be an increasing in triglycerides or decreasing triglycerides. And for men, there may be uh, the opposite effect. I don't remember exactly which direct, direction it went. And for a decrease in triglycerides, what they were thinking with the ketogenic diet is that potentially the ketogenic diet leads to an increase in the production of an enzyme called a lipoprotein lipase. And lipoprotein lipase, or LPL for short, if you'll allow me that luxury, uh, instead of saying lipoprotein lipase enzyme every single time, what it does is it cleaves uh, fat molecules. So it'll cleave the triglyceride into different molecules. And with the cleavage of those molecules, you end up uh, repackaging those into uh, HDL. So the reason there's, they postulate this, and actually other studies have also shown this, and actually also thought this is a similar thing, that it's possible that with the triglycerides, when you have this uh, this dip in triglycerides, it could be because there's an increased expression of LPL, which is cleaving the triglycerides and repackaging them into HDL particles, HDL cholesterol particles. So that's why you see a decrease in triglycerides and an increase in HDL, uh, because they're kind of cutting them up and then just putting them into another uh, particle or another molecule. So that could be the case. And actually, that does sort of make sense based off of some of the other studies that, uh, that I've looked at. Or alternatively, another possibility is that there's more HDL coming from the intestines because the, the intestines can also produce HDL. Okay, wow, that was a lot. That was a lot of physiology and hopefully you, you kind of follow along. But uh, let's go ahead and bring this home and let's discuss the conclusions. What can we actually take away from this? Um, so, and keep in mind that this is very much in favor. This is very much for young, healthy, normal weight women because these two studies looked at those, that population, picked samples from that population. So uh, that's, that's really the, the big point I need to, to make here. Okay, so if you're a young, healthy woman, it is likely, according to these two studies, that a low-carb diet based on high saturated fat, so we're talking 30% or higher, at least based off of what was tested here, without substantial weight loss, so if you lose a few pounds, that's not going to make a difference, uh, increases all forms of cholesterol, total LDL, HDL, non-HDL, and they, I don't think that they looked at IDL or VLDL. And uh, although, and then this part is less certain, uh, may decrease blood fats, so the triglycerides, that was the most contentious point, and uh, cholesterol particle size. So may, and this is something that I kind of glossed over, but one of the studies was kind of making the argument that maybe the, this saturated fat-based uh, ketogenic diet may decrease the particle size, which, if you'll remember, is not something that's favorable. Um, and then the, the other thing was that the one study looked at blood sugar and insulin, and both of those declined as well. So even though with a high saturated fat level, it may still have, quote unquote, positive effects on insulin and uh, blood sugar levels. So kind of a, you know, it's, it gives you both. It gives you some positive and gives you some negative. So and shockingly, we can't say that the ketogenic diet is just going to walk away with every victory, uh, every award known to man. But um, it still, it still uh, has its benefits. And again, keep in mind that this is specific to saturated fat-based ketogenic diet, which is pretty common because it's hard to consume all of your fats or a majority, a vast majority of your fats from unsaturated fats. So 
uh, something to keep in mind. Hopefully it helps. I hope that it does. And uh, I'll certainly be covering a lot more on this topic. So be sure to, to check out my other content on the topic uh, as it releases. And with that, I hope to have the absolute pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one, guys. See ya.